This is Adnan Barambo, and this is Aviapreneur's podcast. Today, I'm going to share with you 40 years of experience. 40 years of experience in the air cargo industry. Can you imagine? My guest today is from Austria. He's an Aviapreneur with 40 years of experience in the logistics and air cargo industry. Good morning, Roland. Good morning, Adnan. It's a big pleasure. Thank you very much. And because you say 40 years, I'm taking my glasses now. Because after 40 <laughs> years, you, you need meanwhile glasses to see everything around. <laughs> so it's a, big, it's, a, it's a big pleasure. Thank you very much for invitation. And uh, my best greetings to all the uh, viewers of your video blog. Thank you very much. More than welcome. So. Roland started his career in 1983 with Schenker & Co. Later, he took charge of commercial, sales, and managerial positions in many of the world's famous and successful cargo airlines. He started with Transport Airlines, Korean Air, Olympic Airlines, Swiss World Cargo, and finally, Swiss Air International. He's currently a registered instructor of IATA in, with IATA, the International Air Transport Association. He's also a course author and developer there. Recently, he started also Grow Now Group, which is a consulting, training, and coaching practice specialized in the aviation, cargo, and airline industry. Thank you, Roland. Thank you very much. And, uh, because, and because you said actually recently, it's already seven years ago, but in air cargo, that might be recently as well. Yes, that's true. <laughs> Glad to know this. So, Roland, let me start with the air cargo. Finally, we have someone from the air cargo industry in our podcast. The last two years in the airline industry can be labeled as the air cargo years. It has been a great two years for the air cargo industry. And we have heard so many people saying that maybe these two years were the best years for the cargo airline industry since the airplane was invented. Was mm -hmm. this the case from your experience? Uh, first, first of all, we have to diversify this a lot, I, I have to tell you. I mean, we should never forget, actually, Adnan, that um, over all the last decades, 60% of the air cargo was transported by passenger aircraft. And only 40% of the air cargo, roughly 40%, were transported by freighters. Now, we all know that within the last two years, uh, passenger aircrafts were grounded, passenger aircrafts were, are somewhere in the desert, and uh, many of those aircrafts most probably will not return because all the older aircrafts which are now in the desert will most probably be phased out. Some of them might be transferred into cargo aircrafts, whereof most airlines, they take uh, into a conversion program, rather aircraft which are newer. A new aircraft might be an aircraft which is like 10 years, 15 years old to convert it into a freighter. So you see that um, we have to see this in the respect diversified because we have or had freighter companies. We have uh, passenger um, airlines. We have airlines which are mixed airlines with freighters and passenger aircraft. And um, what we have seen is that all the freighters were actually, so the freighter networks were growing or more freighters were coming into the world airline fleets. Not to be forgotten, one thing, Adnan, is that already like three, four, five years ago, and, this, and, and, and nobody knew anything about the pandemic at the time, there was already the expectation that narrow body freighter aircraft, so the fleet of narrow body freighter aircraft are actually increasing. So there were like 1,600 narrow body freighter aircraft on order already like three, four, five years ago using uh, secondary airports or small airports. This was the forecast because of the uh, congestion of bigger airports and the slots, uh, the slot issues in bigger air air airports. Now, 
if you see this fact that uh, the industry, and as you just said, the industry made, or did they make the most money, the most revenues within the last two years? I can say yes, but in very specific fields. So when we look into the forwarding industry, definitely the forwarding industry, air cargo forwarding industry, they made their best years because we already know that uh, the numbers, the revenues of the very, very huge um, forwarding uh, uh, consolidators and also of the integrators, so the e-commerce topic not to be forgotten, those figures have been shoot it out to the skies. I mean, uh, they make revenues uh, four times higher, five times higher, even much more. But everything has to do with um, congested capacity. Everything has to do with the strong focus to e-commerce. And everything has to do with that passenger aircrafts were grounded. Now, when we look into freighter companies, pure freighter companies, of course, those aircrafts are flying around like a clock and even more than ever before uh, because the capacity was needed. And let's never forget when we look into capacity and as an instructor and with my own company, we, we give courses, classes and consulting, in example, in revenue management, in business intelligence, in business strategies in air cargo. I can tell you that strategies have totally moved. Because um, what the fact is now is that uh, forwarding agents having their own capacities, they are using their own freighter capacities, which meant they were actually purchasing capacities and they play uh, the game of an airline or they act as an airline to, to be said better. Airlines are looking into the last mile so they play in the field of an integrator so strategies have totally changed in the last uh, couple of years now how does it work actually with a mixed airline so an airline which had freighters and which have uh, passenger aircraft or had passenger aircraft certainly the focus was on the freighters plus converting passenger aircrafts into so to be said freighters using passenger aircrafts also as a freighter. But you should never forget with a freighter, so a passenger aircraft where you took out the seats, you have tremendous more costs because first of all, you can only transport a certain volume and a certain weight. You have to follow certain um, safety and security uh, rules in this aircraft which are also different to a freighter aircraft or a passenger aircraft when you just use the belly capacity of the aircraft. So it's very much diversified. I want to tell you one more thing here. Um, before the pandemics uh, we unfortunately experienced now since two years, there were freighter companies around the world, which very often in September or October, they still didn't know if they will make money end of the year because Selling a freighter capacity is so different than selling the capacity of a passenger aircraft for cargo, so the, uh, the belly capacity. It's a total different strategy. It's a total different aspect of um, selling air cargo because the passenger aircraft will anyhow fly for the passengers. Yeah. So it actually meant always automatically whatever cargo you have on the plane, that's a supplement. That's an ancillary service you are selling uh, to the world, uh, to the cargo world. So actually it, it meant always just an additional amount, additional money. Yeah, A freighter has no passengers. So the whole cost, overflying rides, crew costs, fuel costs, landing costs, whatever you have on costs for the aircraft, had to be paid by the cargo department or by this cargo airline. And you can imagine that operating freighter costs much more money than operating a passenger aircraft with passengers on the flight because the passengers in majority were paying the costs of the operation. Yeah. Now, um, that actually would mean that for a freighter aircraft, like two, three, four, five, ten years ago, for a freighter aircraft, you would have needed to ask for higher rates because you have higher costs, higher rates per kilo. In theory, 
Yeah, but this never happened. Actually, what happened is that on the passenger aircraft flight or on a freighter aircraft flight, you were asking the same rates unless you had a different strategy and you were actually using this freighter aircraft to a specific route or onto a specific route where maybe either no passenger aircraft were flying or just a few passenger aircrafts were flying or you had a specific demand for, let's say, hair shipments, which means very heavy, very outsized cargo operating uh, a freighter. And then, of course, you made very good money with the freighter. Yeah. But in generally to be seen, a freighter costs you more money because there are no passengers. And now just imagine passenger aircrafts grounded, freighters flying, and um, freighters flying around the world for the need of the complete logistic air cargo uh, chains, supply chains. And then, of course, you would ask for higher amounts if the capacities are not available. And that was actually the reason why suddenly the yields were going up like crazy and um, the yields per kilo were like 10 times higher. Yeah, this is nothing, um, this level is nothing which will live forever. Let, let's say it like that, yeah. So, so, the future, so the future is not a guarantee to be as rosy as it was in the last two years. <laughs> now, now, Adnan, can we say that anything in the future is guaranteed? No, not, nothing, yeah. nothing at all is guaranteed. What is an interesting picture to this as well? Uh, there is actually a scientist named Kontradiev, and Kontradiev made an interesting uh, diagram of how the world economy uh, was moving since 1900. Yeah, and he made this picture over more than 100 years, 120 years. Yeah, and it was actually like an up and a down, and and a down. This is a wave which looks like you know when you go for your heart check and you see these waves. It's like it's like a wave which goes up and down, and this up and down waves since 1900 they look actually very regular. Yeah, if you look onto these waves, it's like almost the same up and down. So the world economy at one point goes down and on the other point, it goes up again. Now, if we look into uh, business strategies in air cargo, we have to find actually the right wave going up and, and giving the right service uh, to the right customers at the right time uh, of the moment. Uh, to, to move up to this majority phase on, on very top. That's actually what, as an air cargo company, you would need to do. And uh, I know we, we are going to talk a little bit uh, about innovations for sure, because innovation is, is the key in the future. But as innovative you are, the better you position yourself within your strategy, uh, the better you will um, make money and uh, the better you will also overcome this time of period. Yeah, I'm sure of this. I completely agree. Mentioning the situation in September 2019, actually, I have a personal experience here. In my business, we provide services to some cargo airlines and the situation was not very great and we had some money to collect and it took some time to be collected. And as soon as yeah. the crisis started, ironically, as soon as the crisis started, we were get paid immediately. So mm -hmm. yes, the end of 2019 was not really great. And we heard in the news, many of the cargo airlines in Europe were about to shut down operation mm -hmm. by that period. So yes, as you mentioned, it's not uh, always the case and uh, the future is not guaranteed. But if the chart is as uh, as regular as you mentioned maybe we can predict it in that way um you know now now we have even more events coming in we have uh, a war we have a war around the corner um which of course is is one of the most uh, sad situations uh, having for the for the people in that area in, in this region and it's uh, and it's roughly only 500 kilometers away from us here the border um, and um, these are all events which influence certainly uh, also the air cargo industry. So 
um, when you look into the past, into the past decade, uh, which kind of events have actually influenced also the logistic supply chains um, uh, in air cargo? And we had uh, the financial crisis 2008, 2009. And uh, we know, meanwhile, from all the statistics we have that uh, 2008 and 2009, the impact to the air cargo industry was actually uh, much bigger than the pandemics, yeah? um, which is also an interesting fact uh, we, we have to see. Now, we don't know how the impact of the current situation with the Ukraine will be. Yeah, what we all, what we all know is that flight routes are changed. If a flight route is changed, and um, I tell you, when I started my my uh, airline career, I have worked actually also as a load cheater, and we all know you you need a certain fuel, a certain kerosene to fly on certain routes. Uh, the more kerosene you need, the less uh, capacity you have available on an aircraft. And now if you need more kerosene flying around certain areas, that will bring additional constraints. Yeah. Especially so, with the current fuel price. And we see the current fuel price. Um, on, the, on the other hand, you know, I have looked quite deep into the European fuel prices uh, yesterday and also into the regional fuel prices yesterday. We should, and most probably this is not the case with you in D Dubai, but here we have some 50% on taxation on fuel. Yeah. So, so whatever, whatever we pay on the petrol station, the half actually goes to, uh, to the government. Yeah. Now, um, if the fuel prices go up dramatically, we still pay the half on taxation to, to the government. Yeah. So, uh, what I want to tell with this is whenever uh, prices are rising, whenever yields in air cargo are going up, there will always be someone making money out of it. Yeah. And when we talk about the fuel prices, uh, I, I just said it, government is doing great money with it. Yeah. So, so there's always someone um, being on top within the strategy. And if you actually do it right as an air cargo company, you certainly will, will gain also. Yeah. So uh, trying to brief what you mentioned, the air cargo industry in reality is very sensitive and very volatile. Whatever happened in the outside environment will greatly affect the operation and the strategy of the airline. And this has always been with the aviation industry, and this goes along certainly also for the air cargo industry. And Adlan, Adnan, let's never forget that it's only maximum 4% um, you, you, uh, you have net revenues or, or net shares out of an airline. Yeah? If, you go, if you go to, uh, to a pharma company, you have 400%. Yeah? So, so the, the shareholders uh, of a pharma company, they are happy every year because you get like 400% uh, out of it. And in the aviation industry, it's not even 4%. This is, this is the maximum. So at the end of the day, um, investing into an airline is a questionable story. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, it, always, it always has to have a reason why you invest into um, the aviation business. And there are many, many reasons, and there are many, many good reasons also to invest into aviation industry. But you should know that the return of investment um, might be much smaller than with other industries. Yeah. Yes. That's one of the reasons why airlines in many countries are governmentally owned. Yes, and I can tell you, I have, yeah, and I have been with many, many airlines around the globe, uh, either for, for uh, companies we are working for or for myself. And uh, yes, I have also been with, uh, with airlines um, um, like limited companies, uh, so, so stock controlled companies. I have been with companies which were in an ownership of one family. Yeah. And I have been with companies uh, which have been in the ownership of the country, so of the government. And yes, everything works totally different um, in, in this kind of business strategic setups, how a company is actually run. Yeah? And if a company is, um, is governmental owned, yes, there are, let's say, 
different needs behind. Uh, there is a different empowerment behind. Um, there are different questions behind. Then you would work for uh, an airline or you would act with an airline which is private owned. And I can tell you, I know uh, airlines which are limited companies. They have a clear plan when they open a station. We know exactly within uh, one year we have time or nine months is a minimum actually to open a new station for an airline. Not for a freighter company, not for a charter flight, but if you have a scheduled flight, it's like nine months, normally nine months to one year. And they know exactly that from the first flight, they need to make money. And I have experienced airlines, they say, no, we are going to invest one year into a route. We catch market shares, we invest for one year. And after one year, we're changing our strategy, which means a limited company, they need to make money from the first flight. Uh, a company which is like a private owned company or a governmental company, they might make money only after one year because their strategy is to reach market share in example. Yeah. So uh, it always depends on how the business strategy, how the business model of an airline works, how it's set up. It's the same for, for cargo or, or the passenger front. Absolutely correct. You just mentioned Roland in innovation a while ago. So over 40 years, I'm sure you have seen so many changes, so many developments and so many innovation in the past in the air cargo industry. What do you predict the changes and the innovations and the developments that will come in the foreseeable future? Yeah, we have, to, we have to start a little bit funny here, actually, uh, Adnan, because normally on the cargo side, it is said that cargo is 30 years behind the passenger world. And um, I, I remember very well um, looking into tech books like 30 years ago. And um, nowadays, everything, of course, comes electronic. We have uh, e-cargo, we have wh whatever. I mean, they, they, this, is all, this is all known. But still, and that's the interesting, still, uh, the rules of the tax are still the base of issuing an air bill, making business in the air cargo. Yeah. So um, all the rules are still quite old based. Now, an innovation certainly would be if uh, rules and regulations in the whole industry might change how to make this business, how to run this business. But, um, you know, Adnan, I'm also a licensed business coach. And um, as a business coach, I'm always saying, is there the will to change? Is there the will to adapt? And is there the ability to change and the ability to adapt? Because, you know, when we talk of this big word innovation, it always has to do with change. Innovation is about change. And you cannot just go as a manager to your organization and say, okay, this is a good idea. We change from tomorrow. Your organization is not going to change from tomorrow because maybe your organization doesn't understand what is your wish, your needs to adaptation and to change. So, um, any kind of change management process has eight steps of change. And I know it myself, and I have seen this many, many times. Very often, the management is introducing an innovation or a change at the very beginning, moves to step two, says the change is made, and we have announced everything, we have done everything, we have given you the budget, and then they move to step eight, and for them, everything is done. The problem is that at step two, step three, the whole organization is stopped because they still don't understand what the change and innovation might be or m m what they have to do. Yeah. So this is the biggest problem or one of the biggest problems to adapt uh, an organization and to introduce uh, innovations and change to an organization. What would innovation actually mean in air cargo? Now, everyone talks of technology. Uh, my company, ourselves, we actually also represent on international base a cargo management IT solution. So I am very, very deep into the topic of um, how innovations could look like with a cargo management IT solution, I can tell you. Um, one of the very first things I said to my business partners is we're going to offer all-in packages because 
If you sell like little banana slices to a customer, the customer at one time will come to you and say, you know, Roland, I bought the initial system, but you're selling me like uh, Nespresso, you are selling me the, uh, the uh, coffee capsule every moment. And then you lose this customer. I can tell you, you're, you're losing this customer at one point. On the other side, uh, systems nowadays, when we talk of systems, innovation is not just systems and it's not just technology. So uh, innovations, um, they are very often very far away from the user. And this is one of the biggest problems. I know systems, I know technology, which has done by super IT nerds, I can tell you. And we have many places in the world where we have super IT nerds that starts from India, goes throughout Brazil to many places. But those, um, I, I, I name it IT nerds, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that. But, but those IT nerds, they know the way how to set up a system. Very often, to 99%, they are not stepping with their shoes into the need of the end user. So um, this is one of the biggest issues with um, technology, innovations of, uh, in technology uh, for, for setting up new things. You need to step into uh, the um, shoes, into this need of the client. Now, from the consulting perspective, I can tell you very often the client doesn't know his needs. <laughs> That's a very funny thing. Yeah. Now, I want to give you one example. I had uh, one client um, in, in the region you are, you are calling from. And uh, this client came to me and said, Roland, you know, we are actually on the way to purchase um, a revenue management system for cargo. And um, we are not even at the step of uh, the RFP for the system. But we need to understand and we need to learn what we need to include into the RFP. Yeah. So I actually went to them. I had been uh, with them for a workshop, of a full week workshop. Uh, what they actually need to include into an RFP for a revenue management system. And based on the outcome, yeah? So that was more a workshop like, um, like coaching them as well, consulting them, but also training them. So it was a mixture, it was a mixture of all of it. But um, with all these information, they started to build the RFP, which was a very clever tactic, a very clever way. So first of all, you need to learn um, what do, you, what do your clients need? What do you need yourself? And then with this, you're going to set up an RFP. You're going to set up the needs for uh, the system or technology. Is, but, yeah? is, this, is this the reason why in Grow Now Group, you put three bilers for the company? Coaching, consulting, and training? Because they are very much interconnected to each other. They are very much interconnected on one hand, but they have nothing to do on the other hand together. And, and I, want to tell, I want to tell you why, Adnan. First of all, coaching, and um, I, I went for an education as a licensed coach for over two years. And I can tell you for uh, going in Austria into such an education, you have to go for two years to a psychotherapist. Uh, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't believe that. So you have... Uh, you have to reflect yourself most. This is, this is an important thing. Now, um, coaching is actually not giving an advice at all. That's the first thing. So we don't give advices in coaching. Secondly, coaching is assisting you to look into your unconscious part of activity. And Adnan, we are, we are not uh, two different people, uh, one at home, one in the office. No, that's, that's, not, that's not working like that. We are one person, we are one human, and uh, whatever, how we grew up, what we have learned from parents, from school, from university, uh, from friends, all of this we are taking along to the office as well. And then we grow up, we are becoming managers, and these are like patterns we take along into our daily business. And that's how we perform our business. 
And now I have uh, managers coming to me and saying, Roland, I have an issue with that. And I don't know why. Why is this happening in my office? Why we don't move ahead as I was planning? And I can tell you, they have super strategies. They have set up everything well. They have made the budgets. They have made their numbers, figures. Everything is super, but still it's not working. And then they come to me and say, Roland, what's going on? I mean, everything, everything seems, to, seems to be good, but even though it's not working. And then we look together into the unconscious part of their behavior, of their doing, of their acting. And I can tell you, Adnan, how we are sitting here right now together, we act based on 95% of our unconscious doing. So it's 95% and only what is conscious is roughly 5%. The autopilot. So, the so autopilot. yeah, exactly, exactly. So 95% is unconscious and that's what we are trying to look into in coaching. Yeah. So in coaching, it's an eye opener. I assist managers, I assist entrepreneurs, I assist executives um, to have eye openers about their own uh, unconscious behaviors and doing. And if you have an eye opener, it can change a lot. It can change from one to the moment a lot. And it changes also a lot, not only with yourself, but also with your teams, with your organizations. So that's about coaching. It's very interesting Without approach, actually. It's a very interesting approach where you really now start to realize how coaching is different from training. And that's why I, I, I would like to ask you about Air Freight Academy, the poster I see in the background. It's mainly yes. specialized in training, I guess. Yes, it, it is. But let, let me come just to, to consulting because consulting is giving it advice. I think this is all what, what we know. So consulting is giving you an information. Consulting is giving you an information. We actually have uh, learned ourselves from the past. And then we move to training. And I strongly believe that training is one of the most essential uh, things in life because by uh, founding my company seven years ago, the Grow Now Group, we speak about growing. We speak about personal growing. We speak about organizational growing. And that has to do with training. But it is also important that we look into training very much different than uh, training organizations did this in the past, Adnan, because in the past, and you know this self most probably from, uh, from the places you grew up or you are working in, there is an instructor in front, the instructor has a presentation, actually the instructor is just reading the presentation, and the pupils, the, the people which are coming, the participants for the class, they are just watching onto the instructor, the slides, their hand out, and that's it. Yeah. It's a passive training. It's a very passive training. And I clearly said also in Air Cargo, we don't do passive trainings at all anymore. So we have, first of all, a lot of exercises. It's more in a workshop style. It's in, in a hands-on style. Uh, we do very interactive things. And um, we, have, uh, we have founded the, the Air Freight Academy actually in cooperation with Linz Airport. And in Linz, we have the possibility to go through uh, the complete warehouse as well, which means you have your training class with a lot of exercises, with a lot of interactive learning. And then when you have learned like module one, two, three, we go to the warehouse and we also see how it's really functioning and you can touch it. Yeah. Adults need to touch things. And this also during um, learning and during training. We have also found, founded the uh, German language uh, Luftfracht Academy because training is more and more regional. Training is more and more regional because during the pandemics, uh, still the travel was limited or is still limited somehow. And um, it's more about that you also need to learn in your language. That's why we have found this, and let's never for, let's never forget we have a market, a German spoken market of hundred million people, uh, which is not which is not a small market. In addition, we became in our Air Freight Academy an IATA regional training partner. We are now running twelve different classes to to many different dates, especially in the pharma topic, in the handling topic. 
We offer the complete IATA Pharma Handling Diploma uh, at uh, our academy. And in addition to this, we also offer a wide range of English language uh, virtual classes, so online classes. Yeah. By the way, our online classes, they also come with a lot of interactive exercises. And I think you have experienced this already one time, Adnan. Indeed. Actually, I, I came to know you through by being a student of one of, of your classes. Yes, you're one of the very young students I had in my classes. <laughs> <laughs> I was very I was very I was very happy because you had a lot of questions. You know, um, in, in, virtual, in virtual classes, the interactivity is different. Uh, as an instructor, you have to call in actually for the interactivity. You have to call in the people for having questions, but you had a lot of questions on them. Very happy about that. I'm very happy to hear this. It's very interesting discussion, Roland. We had a great review of the air cargo industry, the general airline industry, and about the, import, the, the important role of innovation and the important role of coaching, consulting, and the training. But very short. <laughs> no, no, it's very interesting and amazing, actually. Before we close, I'm sure the listeners to the, and the viewers of the podcast are very interested to hear your advice and your recommendations for all those willing to join the air cargo industry or to start their own businesses in the air cargo industry, what recommendations would you give them? Now, uh, if, you, if you want to start business, I always have to say, make your strategy crystal clear. Yeah, this, this is the very first thing. You need to have a crystal clear, dynamic, innovative strategy and you need to have very clear USPs, unique selling propositions. If you don't have clear USPs, you can sell to the world. I would not start the business. This is the very first advice um, how to start. Secondly, um, find uh, appropriate investors. This is what I can also say. And there's quite some investors around in the world which are happy to move into air cargo business, especially at that time, I can tell you. So um, take an investor. And when you take an investor, and uh, Adnan, you might know this as well, uh, it's about uh, God feeling. You need to have a good belly feeling, a good chemistry with an investor. And uh, you need to have an investor, of course, which is very much interested into air cargo, but yourself as well as an entrepreneur. Yeah, uh, th this is an essential thing. So strategy, important investor, money, important. Now, the other thing is educate yourself. So train yourself as good as possible. Um, IATA, an example, and you know that we work for IATA. There is uh, a cargo management leadership portfolio available we are also instructing those classes. You also have the chance uh, to come to the Air Freight Academy for a couple of classes. And now we are starting also with, uh, with the dangerous goods classes and also virtual uh, dangerous goods classes. So go for the most important classes you believe which fit to your USP. Um, if you are dealing with live animals, why do you go for a pharma class? If you don't uh, deal with live animals, why going for a live animal class? So define based on your strategy what you need and then go for these training classes. And what I can offer also, Adnan, at that point, um, if, someone, if someone needs an assistance, if someone needs uh, the assistance, which class he would like to or he should go for, uh, you can also announce my email address at any time, and I'm open to uh, advice because the range of trainings, the range of classes is actually huge. Yeah, So I'm very happy to assist and I'm, I'm very happy to, to help all the video blog viewers. And um, that's Thank it. You. The email is info at grownow.com, correct? Yeah, you can you can use that email address at any time. Exactly. Thank you, Roland. I really appreciate these recommendations. They are very valuable and very applicable. Thank you, fellow aviapreneurs. It's a great pleasure to talk to Roland today. I'm sure you have enjoyed this discussion as much as I did. And I look forward to seeing you next week with a new episode of Aviapreneurs podcast. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.